So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on uh, business events in finance and operations. I'm Sunil Garg. I'm the program manager for integrations in uh, finance and operations. And with me today, ha I have you know a couple of my colleagues and dear friends, uh, you know Murray Five, uh, who's a technical solutions professional. I'll in introduce them uh, on their behalf in the interest of time. And then Chris Gatti, who's a uh, program manager in finance and operations as well. So together, uh, we are kind of doing a, a joint session on business events in finance and operations. So welcome again um, to this session. So the next 60 minutes or so, we'll quickly go through the concepts of business events. I'm, I'm sure some of you are already familiar with business events and um, how it can help in scenarios. But we will quickly you know, bring up to speed uh, and be on the same page with regards to what the concepts are. And we'll quickly go through the framework in terms of what is out there today. Um, and uh, we'll understand the features and functions from a framework perspective. Then we'll try to tie those framework concepts into real world scenarios. And to that effect, we will take a look at a couple of demos, uh, one from Murray and one from Chris, in terms of how um, you know, real world scenarios can be affected uh, through business events or using business events. Along the process, we will also try to understand what business value are we going to accomplish you know, as an organization? Uh, why should organizations look at using business events? How does it help to their bottom line, if at all? Uh, so we'll, we'll try to share some of our learnings that we have had along the way, and, and we'll, we'll understand that as well. Uh, towards the end, we will wrap up with quick summary and Q&A. And if we don't have time for Q&A, you know, we'll still be outside and we can have offline um, conversations uh, on business events. So just to set context, right? why business events? How did we embark on this journey of uh, event-driven architecture? And why did we start with business events? <coughs> so when we look at a business process, um, the way we are looking at business process is basically a business process is a chain of events and actions. Right? As we look at how users interact, how users complete their tasks when they execute a business process, users are essentially taking some actions and those actions generate business events. And in response to a business event, either a user or a system needs to take some more actions. And these actions, again, generate business events. And so on and so forth, right? So this is a chain reaction that continues to happen as business processes get executed, as users interact and complete their tasks. tasks. Tasks could be manual, tasks could be automated, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, Somebody has completed some task, and they take an action to tell the system that, yes, I've completed this, and that results into a business event, right? So the whole concept is, can we not facilitate business process integrations using these decomposed concepts of business events and business actions, right? The ideal state will be that you know, we have a rich set of business events, and there are a rich set of business actions. And if we are able to plumb these two together, then we have a good story, a good solution, a much more efficient solution from an integration perspective at the business process level, right? And from a business objective standpoint, the whole idea is to basically streamline integrations um, in terms of making it less costly for our customers when it comes to implementation. And from a business user perspective, it's all about increasing the productivity and efficiency of business processes, right? Thereby making our users more productive so that they can spend their time in doing other value added things rather than spending time in doing things that can be automated or that can be much more efficient. So we will share a case study as we go through this process in terms of what we have learned so far in real customer uh, environments as well. Although the feature is fairly new, so I don't believe um, there is any customer that is live on this feature yet. Uh, but we have been you know, working with some of you in this room as well and, and others that are not there in terms of um, you know, understanding case studies, working with customers to make sure that um, business events is used in the right way. So with that concept, uh, I want to quickly switch gears and walk you through uh, the framework functionality here. So what we see here is the business events catalog. And the catalog is basically showing 
the out of the box business events that are shipped with finance and operations, right? Um, so in the catalog, you can see there are different kinds of business events. For example, the, the first column shows the category of business events. So alerts, for example, is exposed as business event, meaning you can configure alert as you would normally do, but at the same time, now you have the option of taking the business event out of FNO into a Azure event, event hub or an event grid or a service bus, for example, or Microsoft Flow. So you can trigger a Microsoft Flow directly from a alert in FNO uh, using business events. And the same concept extends to application business logic, right? So there are 15 business events uh, across procure to pay and order to cash. Uh, business processes that are shipped out of the box, like purchase order confirm business event, which is highlighted currently, right? Um, so meaning when a PO is confirmed, you are now able to let external systems know that this PO has been confirmed in finance and operations. And then using that information, you can enable several use cases, right from rich notification and collaboration use cases, to systems, uh, to business process integration, where you can actually say, okay, this PO got confirmed, let me, let, let me tell the other system that the PO has got confirmed. Or you can get additional data about the specific PO from FNO, and then continue your business processes on the other side. So this is a near real-time uh, business process integration capability that uh, we, that is how we see business events as. Uh, on top of you know enabling notification and advanced notification and um, near real time collaboration with users, so that's how we see the whole business process get, becoming efficient. Because if we make our users efficient, that accrues to the business process becoming much more efficient. So that's kind of the idea here. <coughs> so. On the right-hand side, what you see here is uh, a description of business event in terms of when this business event will get fired, because there can be several different ways to confirm a PO in FNO. So does this business event cater to all the flow, all the, all the code paths, uh, or does it only cater to when you click the button on the UI and not when the batch is run? So uh, this, this basically explains as to when the business event is going to get triggered. And what we see here is basically the list of fields that will be sent in the payload when the event happens and you receive the event on the other side as a recipient. This is what you can expect in, uh, in the event. Uh, the second concept I quickly want to go through is basically the concept of endpoints. And when we say endpoints, what we really mean is the Azure event grids, event hubs, um, you know, Azure blob, Microsoft Flow, Logic Apps, you know, all these are modern technologies that are out there today, which we must absolutely leverage. So to that effect, uh, finance and operations through business events is now having a out-of-the-box integration capability with all of these cloud technologies in Azure, uh, where you can come in um, and configure based on your integration requirements as to how you want uh, the business events to, to go out, right? So one can imagine um, you know, having domain-specific business process or business domain-specific topics in Service Bus, for example, right? You can have topics by, this is my procurement topic, this is my sales topic, this is my master data topic or customer topic or vendor topic. And then you can configure those corresponding business events and say, all my procurement business events will go to this topic A, the sales business events will go to my sales topic, and so on and so forth. So you have that flexibility now uh, to configure your integration uh, based on whatever the requirements are and then come in um, and express the same thing in finance and operations. So switching back to slides here. So once we set up those business events and once we have the endpoints configured, um, what happens at runtime is what we will look at in, in the couple of demos that you know, Murray and Chris will uh, will show us. But where are we right now, right? So business events was previewed in platform update 24. Uh, that was, I think, end of March, if I recall. And uh, since then, we have been working with um, our, our customers and partners and, and ISVs, you know, some of you in this room as well. Uh, and with your help, you know, we have received uh, quite a good amount of feedback. You know, we did a couple of workshops as well. Um, 
so during the next couple of months <coughs> since March, we actually took time to respond to those feedback. And we, we G8 business events in platform update 26. Uh, so right now it is GA, so you can, what I showed was you know, GA, um, so you can absolutely go and take a look at it and, and start uh, you know, exploring business events. Uh, like we saw in the catalog, out of the box, there are application business events in, in procure to pay and auto to cash um, business process areas. There are workflow business events, which is quite exciting and, and quite important because the workflow framework has natively uptaken business events framework, meaning um, as customers, partners, and ISVs, we really don't have to write a single line of code uh, to get new workflow events, right? Because as users, you can create workflow configurations the way you want, and your workflow configuration will get exposed as business events in the catalog itself. So you can have your custom workflows. You don't have to write a line of code. Those are exposed as business events right off the bat. And that is something that you know, Chris is going to go detail into, into one of his demos. Um, as we saw, alerts are also exposed as business events. So these are the out of the box business events that we have. And business events comes with a programming model, meaning you as um, customers, partners, and ISVs, you can easily extend to add your own business events. Right, not just business event, but the concept of endpoint is also extensible, meaning you can add support for MuleSoft if you would like, so that business events can be sent to MuleSoft if that is the integration platform uh, you are already using, or Oracle Service Bus. It doesn't matter. The constructs are the same. Uh, you can go and extend and implement those interfaces, and, and you will be able to realize the end-to-end -end functionality uh, as standard. <coughs> Uh, Microsoft Flow integration is, is first class now, as we will see again. Um, so you can directly trigger Flow applications uh, from finance and operations using business events. So the hard question, right? This is cool, right? Business events are cool. Business events can do so many things. The potential is unlimited. But the real question is, what business value does it add, right? So we've been working with few customers um, where we are basically looking to understand their business processes. And we are breaking apart the business processes the way it is integrated today from an integration perspective, not from a functional perspective. And seeing what value can business events bring uh, in terms of first, simplifying the integrations. And second, what is the bottom line impact to the business, right? So I'll share some insights that we have derived so far. The first big area of impact is, as we are seeing, is reduced usage of batch, right? Because today, in integrations, when we look at it, there are several batches that are run on a periodic basis. It can be as uh, frequently as every five minutes, or it can be every two hours or once a day. It doesn't matter. But the point is, any reasonable sized integrations will have few hundreds to few thousand of executions of batches every day. And if we drill into the reasons as to why it is configured like that and what is the requirement, more often than not, it boils down to there is some polling logic that it is running just to know if something has happened or not, right? Like urgent sales orders, right? Out of 100 sales orders, five sales orders will be urgent. And when that urgent sales order comes, we want to process and prioritize that over other things. So those are genuine business requirements. But technically, from an integration standpoint, OK, let's schedule a batch that runs every five minutes, because I don't want to delay um, the processing of an urgent sales order. right? So this was an exercise we went through one of our customers. And, we, uh, and these are real numbers. right? And they have not implemented this yet, but this is just um, the process we went through. So we have, what we learned was we can reduce the total number of batch executions by 4,000 executions per day. So it was their la integration landscape. It was a complex integration landscape, right? Uh, several systems integrating and several batch jobs scheduled. But what we realized was, OK, let's just break it up. Let's enable few business events in these touch points. And we don't need batches, right? We can just save these wasted executions, wasted system cycles, and reduce the load on overall AOS and FNO uh, system. And not just that, we can 
introduce efficiencies, right? That is where we go into the next um, set of benefits, which is uh, we, can, we can foster real time, near real time uh, notification and collaboration with users, thereby making them much more efficient. And, and without naming um, you know, customers or anything, I think there is a potential for saving some full time um, resources on the team, right? And what does that mean? That translates to, hey, we can have these full-time resources focus on other value-added things rather than doing the same thing over and over again. So that was a realization that, that came, came across. Secondly, if we are able to process you know, customer invoices efficiently, then we create opportunities for better cash flow. If we are able to process vendor invoices much more efficiently, then we create opportunities to negotiate aggressive payment terms, for example, right? So those are uh, clear-cut opportunities where cash flow can be directly impacted. And again, this is all theory as of now, right? This is the work that we have done over a two-day, three-day workshop with all the business analysts on the team where there is, a, there is a good opportunity to have this bottom line impact. But once they implement the business events and things go live, that is when we, we get to know realistically what's going on. But this is the current state and this is the learning that we have so far. The other benefit is all the parties that are involved in the business process, which is internal, external, trading partners, or, or suppliers, <coughs> by nurturing near real-time collaboration and communication, we basically improve the overall satisfaction, whether it is customer satisfaction or supplier satisfaction, it doesn't matter. The entire ecosystem is much more informed in near real-time, which builds confidence in your organization's business processes, and that improves the overall satisfaction as well, which we cannot put a dollar value to that, but that is something that goes a long way in the overall uh, you know, scheme of things. So these are some of the uh, learnings that we have had, uh, which we find it very useful, <coughs> and we, we keep sharing that over, there's one more thing I want to show. <coughs> so this is the business events documentation. Uh, it basically walks through uh, the things that we have been talking about. Um, the thing that I wanted to show here is basically the use cases for business events. And the intent for starting a wiki like this is, is primarily to, to share from community as to how they see business events being used. So this list of use cases is not from Microsoft. I think two or three are from Microsoft based on our learnings from, from, from customers. But this is primarily contributed by community, by, by some of you, by people who are not there in this room, but basically MVPs and all of them have and are contributing uh, to how they see business events being useful. So one thing that I will suggest is please go through this. this. This triggers thoughts in terms of, okay, I can use business events for this reason as well, right? Um, so that is the intent of starting such a wiki which is to create a, a, a community around how people are seeing they use business events. So please take some time to um, look at this as well. So with that, I'll, I'll quickly hand off to Murray uh, for a quick demo on business events. Murray. Okay. So, so business events are cool. Business events are the best thing ever. Because, and, I, and I'm really excited about it because everyone else, CRM and all of them, they've had a way that they can trigger flows and they can have all these workflows running in the background. We really haven't had that up until now. And what we can do with this um, is pretty darn cool. So what, let me swap over to, I think, eight. So the... Um, Chris is going to show workflows. So workflows are more controlled and, and also already sort of partly in the system. But there are a lot of processes that you need to, that you may want to manage that may be outside of the system. And that's where I'm going to show you how we use alerts and the uh, uh, business events to do that. And Sunil said to me, he said, oh, what, what examples can you think of? And I was thinking, well, a lot of things are business processes and checklists that need to be performed. We've got some of that functionality in Dynamics, but if, you're, if you've got a new product introduction or a new customer onboarding, then there are steps and exceptions that need to be managed within the system. 
So what, what I'm going to do here, let me just go back. is I'm going to create a new customer. And I'm going to assign it a group, and then a zip code. And what would normally happen, and, and ever, this isn't rocket science for, for all of you, but what's normally going to happen when we go out and create this customer is the customer just goes live. But as a prospect, as it's coming in, then there's probably a lot of things that we want to do. We need to set up the credit terms. We need to set up delivery terms. We need to make sure a salesperson is assigned to it. And right now, a lot of that's just informal. And if you do have a formal process, then a lot of times it's email, and you're monitoring, and you're trying to manage all of this. With one customer, that's not that big of a deal, but with... Uh, more customers coming in or being onboarded, then uh, that starts to become a little bit more work. So I thought, how could we do this or how could we show these business events happening in the background, helping us and enabling us to trigger this? So what I did is I thought, well, we've got Planner within Office. And it, it can give us tasks, it can assign tasks to different people, and also it has a link into Flow. So as I go out and as I create a customer, then this is going to use the alerts function to go out and trigger an event to say, we need to, what do we need to do when a new customer comes on board? So as you can see here, I've got uh, some customer setup tasks. And the good thing about Planner is we can go and look at this as charts, we can look at it as a schedule, we can see who's been assigned to it. But as I look over, then this customer that I just added has already been assigned one task. Now, in the background, what's happening is that the business events went out and called out to Flow and initiated this event. And what, uh, what I'm doing inside of this is that whenever a new customer gets uh, created, then I'm going out and doing some things. What I'm doing is I'm going out and grabbing the customer information, I'm creating a deep link so that I can link to it later on. And uh, as this runs, then 15 seconds ago this ran. So it takes, I've got my business event to run every minute. So there's a little bit of a lag, but not, not a lot of lag. And notice what it's done here. On the planner, it's now created three additional tasks. It says that we need to validate the address, make sure it's correct. We need to assign the shipping uh, delivery terms and the credit ratings. So imagine this is just an ad hoc list of tasks that everyone needs to perform. Now, if I look at this, I've got a task in here with the, for the delivery terms. Now, down here I've got a link for the go, to go directly into that customer. So now, and all of this was created within Flow. So now I'm going out and I'm working as an, in an exception-based mode. And I've got my customer that I've got here. And then down here we've got the delivery terms. So my task here is to go out and say that it needs to, we're going to deliver FOB. And I'm going to save that. Now the reason why I'm doing that is because not only do I have a business event that goes out and creates the tasks that we need to perform, it's going out and watching for those tasks to be performed within Dynamics. So I've got an alert that says whenever the delivery terms change, then go back and in a second you'll see that the delivery, that task will actually be checked off by flow and then move down into the, um, into the lower area. Also what you saw was actually Teams integration. So the thing is, business events just goes out and it creates things, it creates events. But what you can, since you can go out to flow, then you've got the whole breadth of sort of applications that you can take advantage of. So now I've got our flow is going out and saying, I've now got this address that's been created. I've, uh, I'm doing this two ways. It's going out and validating the address. It's going out to Bing, Bing Maps and doing a reverse lookup. So it puts the address in, finds a long lat, and then puts the long lat in to go out and create it. And now all, 
a whole slew of things that's sort of lighting up along the way. So, so I've got that and I could go in and go into the customer, but if I wanted to, I could go into my bot. And the bot is going out and giving me interactions. So I've triggered this off, the address has been validated. Do I want to go and ch uh, accept this address? And I can say yes. And now it's going to confirm that and use flow and go back and update it. Now, as this went along, then if I look at my uh, customer address that I've got here, then it's tracking all the changes that I did. And then in a second, since I approved that task within the bot, it's going to go and mark that just like I've got here with an earlier one that I created and, and uh, reduce all these tasks. So all of these, the things with business events is that they're just triggering and uh, based off things happening within in Dynamics. And if you chain them together, then you can create flows and you can create work processes that we couldn't ever do within Dynamics or without going out and doing coding and we couldn't take advantage of these tools. So notice here, within, uh, within a minute of it, it's gone out and said that I've changed my delivery terms and I've validated the customer address. So now we've got this checklist that we can always go back to. Now we don't have to use Planner, we could use Office, we could use uh, Teams in other ways. We could go out and use tasks within Office to assign these tasks out. All I'm doing is I'm just tracking it, but it's all enabled through here. Now, the thing that makes this available is, and the version, what I'm showing, is that we can go out and if you, uh, new customer created, oh, all I'm doing is registering alerts. So any time we register an alert, then we can make that uh, surfaced within, within the business events and then go and grab it. So any change that you want to make within the system, if you have new records being created, if you have records being deleted, if you have fields being updated, then all of that just flows directly through into the business events. And uh, no, there's no more programming that's involved. Everything I did here was just done through little micro flows which did specific things, for example, when, for example, I go out and uh, my delivery terms are changed, then I've just got a simple flow that's going out and grabbing the information, uh, uh, condensing it down, and doing the transaction, then going and updating something else. So that's where just the business events by themselves give us all of this, uh, all these triggers and all these sort of things happening in the background. So, so that, that's all I'm showing. It's just a little small flow that's running and and managing your entire customer onboarded. That's all. Yeah, just all. all right. So now we're going to swap over. Your yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about workflow to flow. Um, I think you're five. Where am I? Seven. Seven. Is it? Or six? <laughs> okay, there. Yeah, just a little flow. You can hear me okay? Yep, yep, yep. Yes, okay, good. Um, yeah, so uh, Sunil's talked about kind of the basics of uh, business events. Mario showed uh, off quite elegantly uh, a lot of uh, flow stuff with business events. I'm going to talk about workflow to flow. So there's a number of business events that are out there right now, and you can see those in the business events workspace if you've got PU26. Who's used an environment with PU26 or newer? OK, I like it. I like it. That's good. Um, yeah, so you'll be able to see in that business events catalog, there's a lot, uh, there's a, there's a lot of events for um, application, uh, a lot of business events for, for the application, um, but there's a large number of business events that you'll see in there for workflow uh, specifically. Um, so what do I mean by uh, workflow to flow? So what we've done is we've created these business events, um, events on starting and stopping workflows, starting and stopping uh, elements. Um, when a work item gets created, there's an event that's uh, firing off and doing something similar to what uh, Murray was showing, we can take advantage of those uh, in Flow. So we can facilitate notification about key workflow events. Um, we can facilita facilitate completion of approvals and tasks uh, via Flow. And that's what I'll be showing uh, in just a minute as a demo. Um, and then for some reason, the screen went blank. Oh, good. Um, and then 
Yeah, Murray really showed off that uh, you've got a lot more notification mechanisms that you can take advantage of. Um, and then as far as the flow approvals are concerned, you can do those via email, you can do those via the uh, Flow app, and you can do those in the approvals uh, center inside of Flow. So currently, so in PU26, we added um, kind of, we made the business events uh, for workflow uh, publicly available. Um, so a flow can be triggered by a business event um, on uh, work item creation uh, for approvals and tasks. And you can take advantage of that, um, grab that, and then facilitate validation and completion of that uh, approval or task work item uh, with the user uh, using flow. Uh, in addition, I mentioned the ones below, the started and finished for the workflows and the elements that we added. So what is this approval process that I'm just about to show? So when uh, usually in uh, finance and operations workflow, a user submits uh, a, a document for approval. Uh, it goes into the, the batch process. Someone then approves that. And then it comes back as, as, a, as an approved uh, business document. With Flow, there's a few more steps, so I wanted to walk through those. So you can see in the top uh, left here, the user is submitting the business document for approval. The batch process is going to pick that up and create a work item for uh, that approver or for each uh, approver. And then for the work item, there's going to be a business event that's fired off that Flow can take advantage of, and it gets triggered by that. Um, it can then send an approval to the approver uh, to say, come on, uh, give me an outcome, give, you, give me a response. The approver selects an approval outcome. Um, and then Flow will call an OData action that we're using for the completion of the work item. And then the batch process sees that that work item is complete, um, just like it would be if they went into the uh, finance and operations web client and did that. The, it'll complete the workflow. And then there'll be some business logic that'll go ahead and update the, the business document. So I will uh, jump over here. And the business document I'm going to be using is free text invoice. So free text invoice is just a simple um, workflow. I'm going to use that for demonstration purposes. So I'm just going to create a new free text invoice here. It's not going to be anything fancy. Yes. We're just going to pick a customer account. And then we're going to add a single line. We're just going to use one of the basic main accounts. And then we're just going to give it a unit price. And we're going to hit, we're going to hit save. Conference Wi-Fi. We've got an amount that got filled in here, got defaulted, and then we've got our workflow menu that shows up up here because this uh, business document is workflow enabled, and now I can submit that workflow. So we're hoping for approval via flow. We'll submit that one off. Great. So you can see the workflow status on this. I pulled in that workflow status field so you can see that. So that's submitted. Um, so that, that free text invoice workflow is very, very simple. It's just one uh, approval element. Um, and then it just has a single step in there. And then if I go in here into the properties, we can see that the assignment is user. The user that it's assigned to uh, is myself and a colleague. Um, and then the completion policy that I have set up is just single approver. So I can approve it, uh, and it's uh, good to go. So very simple workflow. And so once workflow picks that up and that business event fires, the flow that it's going to uh, trigger, I would sh So in flow, I'll just show you that quickly. And I'll jump into the slides. So in flow, we've got this nice block designer. Uh, unfortunately, the reason I'm going to show you some slides is because when you're going in and you're hitting the metadata uh, service on the environment, sometimes if the Wi-Fi is a little spotty, uh, it doesn't show up with all of the different fields uh, down there. So I'm just going to jump back to the slides and show you that flow design. So we've got some documentation, I should say, up front uh, out on the doc site. Um, and I'm going to be adding uh, a bunch more um, based on the, um, the work that we're doing. So this is the flow design. 
When a business event occurs, you can see it up top here, we parse out the JSON, kind of the payload for that business event. We're gonna validate that work item, make sure that it doesn't have any, um, anything that requires the user to have to do this inside of the web client. Um, maybe there's a value that wasn't updated, maybe there's some, something that needs to be updated actually on the free text invoice or on the other uh, business document. If that returns uh, no, then we'll just send a notification and we'll say, hey, you've got this uh, business document here in finance and operations, you need to go into finance and operations in the web client, make the updates to those fields, and then, um, and then proceed from there. But if it comes back as valid, um, if it's ready for uh, Flow to take, uh, to take the next step, then we can uh, start an approval and we can go and execute the completion action. So I'll just show you those blocks quickly. Maybe I'll just blow this up one more step. So yeah, we're, we're, when a business event occurs, we're taking advantage of that trigger. Um, we're pointing at our uh, environment and we've got our workflow work item category. We've picked our business event and then we've just got uh, a company that we're targeting there. We parse out that JSON, and then the next step is this validate work item uh, block. So same environment, using this workflow work items validate uh, OData action here, and passing in the workflow work item instance ID. So we just pass in the ID of the, of the work item. And then we go into this condition, and then down below, we're going to uh, start an approval we're just gonna pass in the values that we parsed out of that um, payload. So we've got a list of outcomes that we can put in there, um, a work item subject, we've got our user email, so that's who it's actually gonna get assigned to, who it's gonna get sent to. So a uh, approval is gonna get sent to me and to my colleague Gayathri because uh, we're both set up as approvers. And then we've got some details that we can put in here. So I use the step instruction you can put in whatever text uh, you're interested in. And then, and then once the approval comes back, so whatever that response is, whether it's uh, an approve or a deny, um, that gets passed into this, uh, into this complete action, this OData action, back in the environment, passing in again that workflow, work item instance ID, and just passing that outcome in, and then the comments um, and then this target user and run as user, this allows the this allows flow to kind of function as me or as the as the person that's actually doing the approval. So we'll jump back over and we'll look at once we have done that, once we've set up that flow, we get this active event in our business events workspace. And so all of the flow subscriptions just show up as active events. And you can see this one here for this free text invoice workflow. Um, the approved free text invoice uh, element, this work item, um, workflow work item uh, event. And you can see the, some identifying information for the flow uh, right here on the right. Right there. Great. Um, whenever you send out the approval to flow, so flow is facilitating approval, but it's worth noting that in the workflow, in the work items assigned to me form, I'll just refresh this data. Um, that work item also shows up for approval in finance and operations. So it's always an option to either approve inside of finance and operations or uh, via flow. Um, so we can see that uh, free text invoice approval request is coming here uh, into my email inbox. I can from here approve, reject, request change. I can hit approve, put in a comment, and then hit submit. But I won't do that, because I'll show you uh, a couple of other mechanisms. So back over uh, inside of Flow, I had one approval waiting. But in this, uh, in this approval action item space, we can see that this one just came in uh, four minutes ago waiting for uh, approval. Um, so I can approve here. The other way that we can approve, let's see if this is going to work for me. Yeah, inside of my Flow app. So I don't know if you can see that, but I got a notification. And then, and then inside of my Flow app, I can also approve. So there's a bunch of different ways that someone can do that approval once it's facilitated via Flow. Um, the one that uh, people that have talked to us about approval inside of finance and operations seem to be most excited about is that approval via email. 
uh, is one that we've been asked for a lot. Um, so that's going to be uh, a big boon. So I'm going to use this uh, approval action center uh, from flow. I'm going to choose my response and I'll approve that. And we're just going to confirm that. And so that's called that OData uh, action uh, to complete it um, and pass in the approve uh, as, the, as the outcome that it shows. Um, and while the batch process is just picking that up, I'll just quickly jump over to the flow run history and show you an example of what you can expect for a, uh, a run history. I'll just jump back out. So this is the, this is the flow that uh, we have created. And I'll just grab one of these. Uh, oh, actually, is this? Yes, this might be the one right here. So this is the one that we were just running. So we can see our flow runs successfully. We can see uh, flow breaks down all of the different steps and provides a nice little kind of check mark to show you where it's gone. Um, and you can see all of the values in here as well is uh, really handy. So inside of this pars JSON, I can roll through here and see that in the, in the content, we can see that approve uh, outcome possibility. Um, and we can see, where is that? We can see that here's this workflow user email. This is one of the fields that uh, we took advantage of in Flow. So you can see all of those values inside of Flow and kind of debug uh, what's going on. And then when we get, we get to the condition, we can see that Flow delineates between the no and the yes side. So we can see it ran through the yes slide. Um, and running through here, we, again, we can see the details of that approval. Um, so we've got kind of our full um, audit capabilities by looking at the, at the workflow, at the history inside of Flow. Um, and then we can see our uh, completion and when it, exactly when it uh, called in and what it, what it provided. So back inside of, back inside of, uh, finance and operations on this free text invoice. We were previously seeing uh, that it was submitted, but if I hit the refresh here, it should now show up as approved. It does. And then inside of uh, my final thing, just going to show you inside of this uh, workflow history, you can now see in this nice list that we added more recently to the workflow history form, we can see that it was submitted by Julia Funderburk, the admin. Uh, and we run through here. Um, it was assigned to either C. Gardy, we can see on that row, or Alison Brown, that was the, the person, the user, the, the, yeah, the, the worker that uh, Gaia, through my colleague, uh, has associated with her account. And then the approve action was taken by C. Gardy. You can see the comment that I added in there, approve via flow, and then the, and then the pushback uh, and to complete the workflow with a full kind of timeline of that. Great, so that is workflow to flow. I'll just jump back and talk about what we're doing from here. So right now you have to create that flow template by yourself, but we're, we're uh, working right now on the flow templates to facilitate work item completion. So you'll be able to go into flow, pull up that template that I was just using um, and take advantage of that as a starting point. Um, we're also adding additional document uh, and workflow context. So we want to put more of the document uh, context in there so you can give information about um, that free text invoice without having to reach back in. So you can always do that, make a, a call back into finance and operations to get additional data and put that uh, directly in an email or in the uh, instructions, uh, what have you. Um, some additional workflow context pieces that we haven't added uh, quite yet. And then we're working with the application teams to to refactor their validation code. Right now, um, a lot of uh, workflows have some validation code that runs in kind of an ad hoc way. We're refactoring that into, a, into an interface. And we'll have more details about how partners and ISVs can take advantage of that. Um, and then um, starting soon, our next step will be not just being able to facilitate work items via flow and kind of respond to the, the events that I talked about. Um, but we want to make it so that you can trigger a flow from inside of the uh, finance and operations UI. We'll, 
will probably be taking advantage of business events for that as well. Um, but it'll allow you to kind of sidestep what is right now the finance and operations workflow side of things and just have that flow, uh, the, the flow facilitating the, the record change, the, the record approval, um, and having that, using that flow run history as the kind of the only history uh, of that action. Yeah. So I'll hand you back over to Sunil. Hello. Uh, my question was, if you could talk about uh, the licensing model with the users that are interacting with Flow uh, through business events. That's part one. And then second is, uh, as these business events are creating work items outside FNO, um, back in the day, I mean, currently, uh, the user security kind of controls who can approve or who cannot approve. But well, once these work items are being approved outside, how, how are we managing the security aspect? Uh, what's the vision with that? Okay, so I, there are two questions. I will break it up into three questions. Um, first one, talking about licensing. From a flow licensing perspective, nothing changes in the context of business events, right? Um, so the licensing from flow <coughs> continues to be the same and, and flow controls that licensing aspect of it. Think of business events as just another trigger that is going to trigger your flow. So there is nothing specific from an FNO perspective on the flow licensing aspect, right? The second aspect of security, I'll break that into two parts, and I will want Chris's help yeah. on the <laughs> other part. Uh, so first, from a basic security perspective, what we lack today is that the business events catalog is not tied to role-based security, right? So meaning, this is not a big deal for somebody who is interacting with FNO per se, because you can absolutely not give access to the business event catalog to a non-admin user. That is possible, that you can do. But what is not possible is, especially this affects the flow scenario, where when you click the drop down and you see the whole list of business events, which is nothing but the entire business events catalog, that is where security is super important because we don't want the Nancy's in the organization who is going to create a simple personal flow to get a text message when she submits an expense report or when her expense report is approved. We definitely don't want her to show the rest of the thousand business events uh, that are there in the system and allow her to subscribe to a payment posted business event, for example, right? That is absolutely um, not right. So as we speak, we are actually working on um, tying role-based security to each and every business event in the catalog. Meaning as an admin, you can go and uh, do mappings for a business event to one or more uh, FNO security roles. That way you can say that, hey, the expense report submitted or approved business event is okay for assigning to all employees, for example. Whereas the Accounts payable related business event is only applicable to the accounts payable manager, accounts payable clerk, and so on and so forth. So once you do that, then what will happen is in flow, when you go in with your user context and you click the drop down, you will only see the business events that your admin has authorized you uh, to see and subscribe to. So that work is happening as we speak. It will be part of PU29 if everything goes as planned. Um, so that is absolutely P0 item for us to address right away. Now, with regards to security from a workflow perspective and flow, Chris, please take it over. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't delve into that too much. So each of those, uh, so when flow calls that uh, work items complete, um, yeah, that work, that work item complete uh, OData action, it's calling it on behalf of some user. So in flow, there's a little dot, dot, dot up on the top right on each block. And you can execute each block as some user. So we were executing that as an administrator. As an administrator, you have the rights to execute as someone else, so run as someone else. And the, the run as and target user information that I passed in there was like that admin saying, I want to run this completion as 
someone else. Yeah, but the like inside of uh, inside of the workflow history, you'll see the the information about which user that was, and inside of flow, you'll see the information about like who ran the block um, and what like which user was passed in as the as the user to run as. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't sidestep security in, in any way. Yep. Someone on the mic. Next yeah. question. Yeah, I got, I got a couple of questions. Um, the alerts piece, uh, can you filter alerts? Like, you know, I, I only want to see when alerts are processed for a subset of customers or something like that as opposed to like either this record or all records. And then secondarily, it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, the alert is the, the, um, the, the business event, but it could be any one of 50,000 different types of alerts that are in the system, and all of those are going to get sent out to business events and to my flow, which I then have to deal with. Right. Is there a way to split that up? So that's a, that's a good question. So again, we'll split that into two parts, and uh, <laughs> I will have Murray also ex share his experience as you know, we were working on this specific demo. Uh, so as far as alerts are concerned, there are only all alerts are funneled through just one business event. Right. Uh, but there are two categories of alerts. One is change-based alerts. So that is, a, that is one representation of those change-based alerts as one business event in the catalog. Mm -hmm. And the second one is due date alerts, which has its own representation as its own business event. Now, the reason why we did not uh, take the approach of exposing each and every alert in the business event catalog is purely because of one of the reasons that you said, which is there can be you know, 10,000 alerts uh, that are created in the organization because there are so many employees, for example. right? And showing 10,000 business events in the business event catalog just creates a management uh, sure. you know, a challenge. Uh -huh. So which is why we took the approach of doing a mini to one mapping uh, between alerts and business event. Now, from a practical consumption perspective, there is absolutely a need for the consumer to filter out the alerts and then trigger the corresponding business logic. Now, Murray, if you can share your experience, because you had to go through the same challenge here. Yeah, and, and it's, a valid, uh, it's a valid question, because yeah. the good thing about alerts is that you can set them up on anything. Right. And and the bad thing about that is you can set them up on anything. <laughs> so, so then when you set up the alerts, then there's a send external flag. Yeah. If that is not set, then it will not go to the business events. So that's the first thing. You want to, want to filter those out and not turn that on, just carte blanche for everything. Sure. But, but then, as Sunil said, everything is going through, uh, through this one, uh, one event. So the way I handled it is, so if you notice here, I've got two, there are two business events that Sunil was talking about. I've got one for when an uh, alert is triggered and then a time-based alert that's set up. And if I look at my alert, then, and the way I addressed it, is everything up here at the top part is just parsing out and working out what the alert is associated with. And the main part is that it goes out here and it looks and finds out that this is a, what the record is. And then for me, I went out and I worked out what the table was that's being alerted. And then, then I go out and split out my alerts. I could do this as a great big monolithic uh, alert, but I, it's easier to visualize and to manage that when I go down to here, I have, have customer alerts, and what I'm doing is I'm calling another subflow that's just for customers. So if I had uh, one for products, if I had one for uh, anything else, then this gives me a way that I can segregate things out and then work with them. And then after I've got that, then, so this goes down and calls the customer business event. Then I break it out, uh, wait, sorry. I break it out just a little bit more and let me find, oh. And then I create another flow, which sort of does the same thing. So this, this makes it manageable, that then I can go and I can track everything. So notice here I've got, I'd have one for when a new customer gets created, and then one for when a field changes. I could even break it out further if I wanted to, but I thought this was just a nice 
sort of grouping. So that's parsed by the, the message, like yeah. the title of the, the yes. alert or something like that. Yeah, so when the message comes through, one of the things that I grumbled about is that with the alerts, the record ID is returned, but it's part of another string. Right. So I had, to par I had to split that out, just use string manipulation and pull it out, find out what the table was, find out what the record was, and then it allowed me to have all this additional control around it. So, so that, um, that's how I managed it, and I think that sort of works pretty well. Another way, uh, I don't know whether we can have, can we have, have multiple, multiple flows by, um, by business event? You can or have right. multiple flows pointing to the same business event. Yeah. Correct. So we allow one is to end subscription, meaning multiple flow apps can subscribe to the same business event in the same legal entity. Um, so that is absolutely possible. Yeah. Okay. So, so another way of doing that is to register a business event that's for customers and then look and see, is this a customer that event? Time it, it, it hit every time the event. All, yeah. Both of those yeah. flows would yeah. then Correct. get pounded. So, so then this is, this is a little bit more... Yeah. Um, Economical. Yep. So, the second question was, how do you uh, generate that deep link? What's that? What's the magic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> deep. Yeah. I would like to, to see what that one. Oh, is it's, it's all documented. It's super is easy. It's a... <laughs> 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 or is that a joke? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, I'm part, partly tongue in cheek because the deep links has always been documented. Uh, but it requires code. So I got a colleague of mine, Ryan, called to go out and create the code within Dynamics for that. Uh, but then that gets published as a service. And then once it's a service, then we can go out and we can call it just through HTTP and grab it. I took it one extra level and then created an Azure function that called down to the deep link. And then I created a... Uh, So uh, one thing that we have discussed as part of this experience is we should probably look at having a, a URL to the record in FNO yeah. as a payload in the alert business event itself. Yeah. yeah. So that yeah. that consumption becomes much more easier on the other side, and Murray didn't have to go through all the hoops that he did. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. go go ideas.dynamics.com, <laughs> upvoted, because I'd love to have that. So that it, took, it took me like days to yeah. work out the yeah. Azure function. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Cool. Thank Thanks, yeah. Yes, please, please use the mic. Thank you. Is there any, uh, uh, do you have any plan to deprecate the workflow? Sorry, uh, deprecate what? Uh, workflow. Workflow? Workflow, yeah. Uh, Chris so, just stepped out, uh, but as far as I know, um, the way Chris was thinking about us, I don't see us deprecating workflow uh, because there are uh, there's a lot of value in what AX workflow has, especially yeah. around the provider right. concept, right? Because unless and until we figure out a way to extract that logic out and still have extensibility story around that, mm -hmm. where today you can go and apply and plug in your own provider and have your own approval a logic there. Uh -huh. I don't see us taking that out. Yeah, I think but so. we will facilitate <laughs> both flow and workflow, and customers can choose which one to use. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So there was a, a discussion around dedicated service for uh, triggering these business events. Yeah. Can you share some insight about that? Right. So uh, the question is around. How are business events getting processed? So in PU 24, 25, and 26, uh, there is a need for you to go and schedule a bad job. Uh, there is a dedicated bad job for business events processing. Uh, so it can process as fast as one minute. But starting PU 27, what we have done is we have, um, you don't no longer need that bad job because out of the box, AOS assigns some four threads by default for processing business events. It is still processed by batch, but the threads are pre-allocated, meaning uh, it is going to be much more faster to process the business events, definitely faster than every minute. If I recall, I think it, it does every three seconds or something to that effect. So, which means the business events are much more near real time uh, and doesn't rely on a batch job that is scheduled. Yes. Can you use that in order to make 
<laughs> I will I will pass on that message to Chris. <laughs> I cannot answer that right now, but I'll pass it on. No, I don't think that is exposed in the UI. It is all done internally. Um, so no, I don't believe you can monitor that. Because it is not a bad job per se. It is direct plumbing into the, the kernel level. Is the uh, business event activation, is it global or per legal entity? So you have choices. So when you activate the business event, uh, you can either specify a specific company. Yeah or you can just leave it blank, in which case it is all companies. Cool. Yeah. Um, one more question. So the, you talked about tying the role-based security to the business event in yep. PU29. That's also by legal entity That is well? also by legal entity, meaning um, the legal entity assignments in the org-based security will get uh, honored. Good, thank you. Yes. Can you please use the mic? Yes. I have two questions. Is there any way to, to send an attached document from FNO to the, to the flow? For instance, the invoice, the invoice, the vendor invoice, in order to make the approval for the, from the email seeing the, uh, the, 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 the invoice? So that's a good question. So basically the question is, can we attach the, the source document, but not like the FNO source document, but uh, the invoice or the PO as an attachment? Uh, Yes, you can absolutely do that because you will have to go and extend the data contract for that business event and you can, you can write whatever you want. But is that a good thing to do? Uh, it depends on the size, right? Because one thing that we keep talking about from a guidance perspective is keep business events simple. <coughs> events are supposed to be very you know, short, fast, nimble, right? But if we stuff it with heavy payload, then it becomes slower and slower and slower, yeah. right? A link to the document. That is a smart way to do it, which is, hey, let me upload the document to the blob, for example, and just send a URL, and the recipient can download, and they can do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Or, uh, sorry, or you can also make a call back into FNO for using OData and get the full PO, for example. That is also an option. Yeah. That, that's what I'd do. I'd go, I'd go and have a secondary call to get the information, and then I'd build the document, and it'd probably be prettier as well. Yeah. Not, not that the documents are ugly, but <laughs> it'll be specialized for that. But if there's an actual attachment, like the original link, send it to AP. Send a URL to that. Okay. Yes. So send an attachment URL. Yeah. To and, with the so yeah. and with the document attachments, if you put them in blob storage, then you can go back and reference them yep. somehow. Okay, the, the, the other question is, when you have the, the, the workflow, the work item in FNO, and also the, the approval in, in the flow, what happens if, if the the approval is made inside FNO or, or the user um, recall the, the, the workflow? What happened with the flow? So that's a good question, right? So I think at the end of the day, this boils down to the fact that the control is still with FNO workflow, right? So the logic that we have today in FNO will continue to prevail, meaning if the workflow document is assigned to multiple people and a couple of them rejected and the logic says that if two people reject, then the workflow document is rejected. That is still honored, which means if a, as a third person, if you go into flow at a later point in time, you will not be able to uh, do anything with the document. Even if you take an action, you will get an error because the document is already either rejected or approved, uh, which is governed by FNO's business logic. Yeah, and, and you, you actually get the message and it says this document is no longer live or valid. Right. So, so it's not, not a horrible message, but it just means that you're too late and it's yep. already been worked on. You talked about the endpoints being extensible. Right. Can you extend that so that it, instead of contacting an external endpoint, it does something internally, like call a class? So that's a good question, and that we keep hearing that you know, uh, very frequently. So unfortunately, today, there is no pattern where you can actually call into a function or, or some method internally itself. Um, the guidance that we are giving is basically take it out and then come back as a function call. Uh, but we are waiting to see more requirements around that aspect. If we see a lot of genuine requirements and genuine reasons for us to enable such a thing, then we will certainly look at it. Thank you. What if that email gets 
<laughs> what if that email gets forwarded to someone else and they don't have the same security? Can they still approve it? No, they will not be able to approve it because I think just like Chris mentioned, um, it, it takes into account the user's um, credentials, even though it is doing on behalf, uh, it will not be. I think we are four minutes over time. So thank you so much. Thank you for taking time. Yeah.